Awesome Rev students, I'm so excited for all of you guys to be here as we kick off our relationship series for the year. Uh, how many of you have been a part of one of our relationship series before? Raise your hand. Okay, a good bit of you. And so go ahead and tell everyone, like, it's not that scary. It's going to be okay. We're going to make it through this, right? Like everyone that's been here before, you all survived, right? And you're back again. So we're going to get through this. Uh, it is going to be great. This is probably one of my favorite things uh, to talk to you guys about because uh, it has so much meaning and so much uh, impact on your lives. And so I'm excited that we're diving into this today. Uh, as we begin, I was, uh, I was thinking our series is called Potential, and I was thinking about stories that are full of potential, like inspiring stories that you hear about. Like when you, you hear about a story and like someone is facing adversity or something has happened and despite all the odds, they like achieve the thing or they do the thing. I have a couple written down right here to tell you about as I was looking up. The first one is Dr. Seuss. Does everyone know Dr. Seuss? No, some of y'all. Green Eggs and Ham, The Grinch. Okay, yeah. I figured I would get y'all with The, the Grinch. Uh, Lorax, so, so many great books and stories written by Dr. Seuss. But what you may not know is before he was the Dr. Seuss that we know, he was an aspiring author who had never written a book before. And his first book that he wrote, he, he sent it in, he was excited about it, he was excited about the potential that it has, and then it got rejected. And he sent it to someone else, and he was excited, and he was ready, and then it got rejected. And a third time and a fourth time, and a fifth time, and a sixth time, 26 times, the first book that Dr. Seuss wrote was rejected. And I, I'm thinking like, if I'm being honest with myself, if that was me, I'd be like, you know what? I think I, I'm missing something here. Like, maybe this isn't me, right? Maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be. 26 rejections over and over and over again but he believed in the potential of what he had. And it finally got approved and published. And now we're talking about him here today. Probably within the last couple of months, you've watched The Grinch, right? Because it was Christmas time. He, he, he has impacted our lives with his stories because he believed in the potential of what he was doing. Uh, anyone ever hear of a guy named Michael Jordan? A few of you. He's not, he's not that big of a deal. He hasn't really done anything uh, in his life. No, pro arguably the best basketball player that's ever existed. But what you may not know, when he was a high school student, a lot like you, he was cut from his high school team. He was told that he wasn't good enough. He wasn't tall enough, that he didn't have what it taked. And it was, if you listen to any of his stories or read any of the books about him, he talks about a conversation with his mom where she spoke the potential into him and said, hey, you need to do the things, go work out like you believe you're the best. Go practice like you believe you're the best and spoke the potential of who he eventually was going to be into him and that he had to believe that for himself even when he looked around him, he didn't see the evidence of it. Probably my favorite story is the story of Sylvester Stallone. Anyone know? Sylvester Stallone, a few of you uh, ever heard of the movie Rocky, right? I probably, I should have queued up, I wish I would have thought ahead of time and queued up some Rocky music. We could have like climbed the three stairs over here together or something like that, but I don't think far enough ahead sometimes. But, but before Sylvester Stallone was the Sylvester Stallone that we know starring in so many movies, he was an expiring actor who hadn't really done anything of note. He was struggling financially uh, he didn't have a lot of food. He didn't have a great place to live. He didn't have a lot of money. He actually had to sell his dog because he couldn't afford his food and his dog's food. Like that's how struggling he was. And he was watching a fight from Muhammad Ali. Anyone know who he is? Okay, look, some of y'all know some things. I, I'm, I'm excited about that. He was watching a fight from Muhammad Ali and was inspired by the way that Muhammad Ali fought, that despite the obstacles, like he never gave up, and, and the story of Rocky was born as he was watching this fight. And he went home and he spent the next three days, and three days later, he wrote the original script of Rocky. 
And he, he went, he actually had a casting call for a different acting job that he went to and he didn't get. The, the acting gigs are hard. And so, but as he's being rejected for this acting gig, he tells them about this script he wrote and they said, hey, come back and tell us about this. So he comes back later that day, he pitches his script and these producers love the story of Rocky, but they don't love Sylvester Stallone. And so they, they offer him, and this is, I told you, this is in the 70s. He doesn't have a lot of money. He doesn't have a great place to live. He just sold his dog, and they offered him $300,000 for the script of Rocky as long as he did not star in it. I want you to think about that. Maybe he probably had about as much money as you students do right now. And so think, think about you're in his shoes. You're trying to make it, right? You're trying to make things happen. $300,000. That would actually be a lot more money in today's economy for the script of this thing that you wrote basically about a few days ago. Change his life. Change everything. Except that he believed in the potential that he was the only person who could be Rocky Balboa. And so he turned them down and again and again until finally they caved in and gave him the money to produce the movie to be Rocky Balboa as we know. And the movie Rocky went on to win, uh, to be uh, nominated for nine Oscars, won three of them, and now grosses over $200 million, all because he believed in the potential. Potential is a powerful thing. I have a definition for you uh, I want you, if you guys are note takers, I want you guys to write this down. Potential is having or showing the capacity to become or develop into something in the future. Having or showing the capacity to become or develop into something in the future. And, and potential doesn't just have to do with the relationships. It has to do with every area of life. You guys all have potential. Uh, you guys have potential in the way that you study and work hard at school right now. Some of you guys are gonna graduate and you have potential. The, all of the choices are available to you of where you go to school and what you study. You guys will have potential in the, the careers that you choose. You guys will have potential in the places that you live. You guys will have potential in the hobbies and the passions that you develop throughout your life. You guys have so much potential. And probably one of the most important places that you have potential is in who you date and how you date. One of the places that probably has the most potential for you guys is in who you date and how you date. And we could get so worried when it comes to this topic of dating and relationships and marriage that, that we just have to have it all figured out, that we have to find this person. Some of you guys, like, I'm, I'm gonna break some hearts right now. I know some of you guys have already feel like you figured out who the one is. And statistically, you're wrong. Like based off of all the numbers, I personally crunched them all and figured it out. It's probably not going to happen unless you're Chad Elliott, right? He's the, he's the, uh, he's the, the rule breaker right there. And so you can ask Chad about that later, what I mean. Uh, but uh, statistically, you have probably not met the person that you will end up marrying at this stage in your life. So what does that mean? That means there is so much potential. There is literally all of the potential. You haven't even met the person yet, most likely. You guys have so much potential. And we can get so worried about figuring all the things out. What, what we're gonna do when we get out of school, where we wanna go to study at college, or where we wanna work, or what kind of career we have, or what we wanna live, or who we want to date, that we can miss out on the biggest potential that there is. Because more than the jobs that we will eventually have, and more than uh, the dogs that we will eventually get, and more, more than the house you will eventually live in, more than all of the potentials, the single biggest potential of your life is if you become the person that God has called you to be. The biggest potential in your life is if you become the person that God has called you to be. And we can miss out on that. Like I said, we get so focused on the question of am I, am I gonna find the right person? Some of us are like, am I gonna find any person, right? Like some of us were like, hey, if I could just find one person, I'll be happy. That we miss out on the 
the big thing, the most important thing, the biggest potential in our lives. And, and my hope for you today is that, that you guys walk away knowing that following God and becoming the person that he has called you to be not only affects every area of your life, but it directly affects who you date, how you date, and eventually who you marry. So we're, we're gonna open up some scripture in just a second, but I want you guys to think about this. The, the term dating right now is a, a, a loose term, right? Like someone says dating, you don't always know what that means. Sometimes it just means you're hanging out. The word situationship is a new word. Uh, you have, maybe, maybe you're just talking, right? Some of you are still trying to convince your best friend that, that you only like that person as a friend, even though you like them a lot more. When, when maybe some of our leaders and some of our parents, when, when I was dating, it was called, are you Facebook official or not? Does anyone remember that? Anyone remember Facebook official? Right, it wasn't a real relationship unless your Facebook status said, hey, I'm in a relationship with this person. It, it wasn't the real deal unless it said that. And so it can mean so many things. So as we're navigating, not only tonight, but through the rest of the series, when I use the term dating and use the term relationship, I'm talking about someone that you like more than a friend, right? Are we all on the same page here? Like this is someone that you have, you've caught some feelings for. Maybe you're already in a relationship. Maybe you want a relationship. And, and here's the thing. The reality is that, that most of you in your teenage student years are going to date if you have not already started dating someone or been on a date. And so, so my job and what I want to do is help prepare you to date well, that you have the ability to, to date in a way that honors God and helps you navigate that part of life well. And maybe you've never thought about it before, like that you should prepare to do this well. Like some of you are like, if I can just find one person, I think we'll, it'll just kind of just happen and we'll figure it out, right? Like if, if, if someone will actually just go on a date with me, I think all of the other things will just figure itself out. But, but the most important things in life we want to prepare well for, right? I have a couple of things I've listed right here that we wanna prepare well for. Um, something that you wanna prepare before you do well is eating spicy food, right? I'm not sure if anyone has tried to eat something spicy before without preparing well for it. There's a, there's a show right now on TV called Hot Ones uh, that brings in celebrities to uh, eat an increasingly growing uh, hot wing track of like, uh, like the first wing and then the second wing and then it gets hotter and it's the third wing and it's the fourth wing and it's the fifth wing and you get to like the sixth wing and these people are just crying and they're like, why am I doing this? Why are you guys doing this to me? Like they have memes about it. it, it it's a thing, right? It's something you want to prepare for. You don't want to walk into a situation like that unprepared. Uh, running a marathon. My, my wife is a marathon runner. I'm not sure if you know this. A marathon is 26 Point two miles. That's 26 one miles plus a little bit more. That's a lot of running. Like I don't even like running 26.2 minutes, right? That is more than I want to do in my life. But some people want to run for hours and hours and hours. And if that's something you want to do, you want to prepare well for it, right? You want to prepare for things that are important. And when it comes to relationships, relationships are an incredibly important part of our life and we want to prepare well. So what, what we're gonna be talking about today is, is how we can prepare well, how we can date well, and how we figure this whole thing out. So here, here's my first point for you guys today, if you guys are taking notes. God cares more about who you become than who you end up with. When it comes to dating, relationships, our lives, God cares more about who you become than who you end up with. And so if, you, if you've ever been to a wedding before, how, how many people have been to a wedding before? Okay, the verse I'm about to read you is probably very familiar. It comes out of the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verse four. We have some Bibles if you wanna read with us. If you didn't bring your own, I'm gonna read this for you. It says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. 
Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. As the Apostle Paul was writing this letter to the church, he, he was primarily talking about the way that believers are supposed to treat each other. He's saying, if you're someone who has placed your faith and trust in Jesus, if you're someone who says, hey, I am a Jesus follower, then your life should look like you follow Jesus. And he begins to describe what that looks like, that the way that you treat people, you should love them well, you should not be arrogant or rude, that you should care for them, you should be kind, you should be patient. He begins to to describe what it looks like to follow Jesus in the context of relationships. These are the defining characteristics of those who follow Jesus. And so as we begin to to navigate, hey, more than just a friendship, but some type of relationship, these defining characteristics become so important that we can look at this and say, hey, is this the type of person that follows Jesus? Maybe you have someone you're interested in or, or someone you're thinking, if you put their name in there with those words, would it come out and, and, and make sense? Like, would you say that's a true thing? If you said John is patient, John is kind, John does not envy or boast. If you said Sarah is not arrogant or rude, Sarah does not insist on her own way. For any of our Johns or Sarahs in this room, I apologize. Nothing personal, unless that's you, and then I know, right? I know. But, but the, if you put their name in there, are you saying, hey, that is a true thing? Are you like, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. You see, he, in the midst of him giving us the characteristics of how we should treat each other, we also find the characteristics of the type of people we should seek out, not only in friendships, but relationships. Does it sound like them? Because if it doesn't, We should have a real conversations with ourselves and say, is this the type of person that I should date? Is this the type of person I want to spend more and more of my time with? Is this that type of person? But but more than that, and here's the thing, I'm not preaching perfection to you. Like if we went through that list and, and, and my, I brought my wife up here and she went through that list, she, she would find areas where I have failed and I have not been perfect and I'm not talking about perfection. But what I am talking about is at the core of who they are, would you describe them as a kind and a patient person? Not that they're always kind, not that they're always patient, that they're perfect in those things, but in who they are, have you observed that in them? Have you observed them not be envious or boastful? Have you observed them care for other people? Have you observed them speak kindly to and about other people when they're not there? Have we even thought about what type of person we should date? Maybe that's the biggest thing that you guys should take away tonight. You should actually think about what type of person you should date. Not just that they're alive and they're breathing and they have a pulse, but I should raise my standards a little bit to a person that looks like they follow Jesus. But before we do that, we also have to shine the light on ourselves, right? As we're shining the flashlight, you ever seen an interrogation scenes before, right? They shine the flashlight in the face. They're like, where were you? With like Batman voice, you know what I'm talking about? But before we do that, we have to shine it on ourselves and say, am I that person? Am I kind? Am I patient? Am I envious and boastful? Well, what would the people that know me best say about me? You see, the the way that you live your life matters when it comes to who you date and how you date. You see, the the way that you live your life right now, the the way that you are living your life increases the chances of you finding the right type of person. And the reality is, and this isn't a popular idea probably, but you attract what you are. You don't attract necessarily what you want. You might say, hey, I want kind, I want patient, I want someone who's not jealous and envious and boastful. I want someone who's kind and caring and speaks well of other people. But if that's not what you are, that's probably not what you're going to attract. 
And as you're looking through this list of what type of person would I want to date, what type of person would I want to be with, we have to ask ourselves, what type of person am I? What type of person am I? I said earlier that who you date is, has huge potential for you guys. Who you date has huge potential. It's one of the, the biggest potentials you'll have in your life. But who you become and who God has called you to be is even bigger. Here's my next point for you guys. Who you date may be temporary, but who you become is lasting. Who you date may be temporary, but who you become is lasting. Who are you becoming? If the people closest to you had to describe the type of person that you are, what would they say about you? If we're being honest, that should be a humbling thing. We should be challenged by that. Especially if we're being honest and we're saying, hey, if I'm being honest, it's not, it's not looking good for me. And the reality is, some of us think we're just gonna get into a relationship and figure it out, but if you're not kind now, Unless something changes in your life, you're probably not going to be kind later. If you don't speak well to people and of people, unless something changes in your life, you're probably not gonna speak differently later. If you're an angry person right now, unless something changes in your life, you're going to be an angry person later. What type of person are you becoming? The Apostle Paul in the, the book of Philippians, I believe, he gives us this, this example. He says, hey, if you, want, if you want a target to hit, if you, if you want to know, hey, what type of person should I want to become? What is the goal? Where, what am I aiming for? Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So let your manner of life be worthy. This word worthy here is really interesting. It's the Greek word axios. It means counterbalance. To, to, to weigh or to weigh like, and it means of, of equal value. And the best way I've seen this illustrated to help uh, uh, show you what this means is with a scale. And so I have a scale right here. Now, I'm gonna be honest. When I looked at the pictures online of this scale, it seemed much bigger than what you see in front of you right now. And when I looked at the price of the scale that you see in front of you, I thought I was going to get a scale that is much bigger than what you see in front of you. Yet, this is the scale that you have in front of you in this moment. But in, in ancient times, this is considered an apothecary scale. And, and so what they would do in a, in a tri transaction, they, they would have two sides and they would put something of value or something that weighed a certain amount on this side and they would put something else on this side, and as they would balance it out, they would put it until it was equal, until it was counterbalanced, until it made sense that, that what was on this side made sense based on what was on this side. And what I believe that the Apostle Paul is saying right here, he's, he's saying, hey, the gospel of Christ is on this side who Jesus is, that Jesus lived and that he died and that he rose again and he lives and that he has invited you into relationship, that you are loved, that he lives for you and he fights for you and he intercedes for you and he continues to do that. He's invited you into his family. You've been adopted as sons. The gospel is on this side, way up here. And we're supposed to look at our life and say, hey, does my life make sense based off of everything that God has done for me? Does my life make sense? Does it counterbalance? Does it, does it look, seem like it comes up equal based on all that God has done for me? Based on who Jesus is 
and what he's done. He uses the phrase, the manner of life. There's so many manners of life. He's saying, does the way that you spend your money make sense based on all that God has done for you? Does the way that you, you talk to people make sense? Does it balance out based off of all that God has done for you? Is the way that you treat people make sense based on who Jesus is and what he's done for you? And is the way that you're navigating relationships? It doesn't make sense based on all that he has done for you. It's a challenging thought that we should live our life in a way that makes sense based off of all that Jesus has done for us. If we could throw that verse back up on the screen, I love what it says at the end. Maybe you're wondering like, hey, that's great. Jesus sounds great. What does that have to do with dating? It says striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. That as we are living our life in a manner that makes sense based off of all that Jesus has done for us, we're gonna look to our left and we're gonna look to our right and we're gonna see people side by side living their lives the same way. And at that point, we could say, hey, that looks like a relationship that makes sense. That looks like a person that's living their life in a manner that honors who Jesus is and what he's done. That looks like someone that's following and loves the Lord. That looks like someone I want to be in a relationship with. He has the same thought in the book of Colossians, verse 21, uh, chapter 1, verse 21. He said, and you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, have now been reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, listen to this, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. He said, listen, there are going to be a lot of potentials that come your way in your life. There are going to be a lot of choices that you are going to have to make. There's going to be a lot of paths that you can go. And when, when it comes to the potentials in life, there are going to be times where because of sin and we live in a broken world, it's going to be realistic and sound realistic and reasonable to shift from the gospel. That the way that we treat people, the way that we talk to people, the way that we spend our money, the way that we live our lives, the way we interact in relationships, who we date and how we date, that it's going to make more sense to shift from the gospel. And Paul here is trying to remind you, he says, remember Jesus. Don't you remember the Jesus that lived and died for you? Don't you remember how you were his enemy, how you were evil, how you brought nothing to the table and Jesus still went to the cross for you? When it comes to the, the future potentials, the jobs and the relationships, like I said, there's gonna be the danger to shift from the gospel, to no longer live in a manner worthy that, that our scales would become unbalanced as we evaluated on who Jesus is and what he's done. And he's saying, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. As the world tells you that you don't have to worry about who you date, you just need to go date that you don't need to worry about setting up relational boundaries. Do what feels right. It's gonna encourage you to shift with all the potentials of the future as the world is saying, hey, it, it, it makes more financial sense for you to just move in before you get married to someone. And culture is saying, hey, just shift from the gospel. Paul here is saying, remember what Jesus has done. Live your life in a way that makes sense in all the areas of your life. But one of the most important is in your relationships. He finishes this thought in verse 28. He says, in him we proclaim, 
warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. The reality is, is that there will be a moment at the end of our lives where we will come face to face with Jesus. And he says on that day, Paul said, hey, my, my goal is that you will be presented mature. That, that word mature means grown up, that you would grow in your faith, that, that on that day your life would make sense based on all that Jesus has done for you. He says, on that day, you'll see him face to face. And I know for me, I don't want to walk into that moment with my head bowed in shame because I've lived a life that didn't make sense. I want to walk into that moment knowing who Jesus is and who I've been following and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. My last point for you today is this. Our goal at the end of our lives isn't to be married, but to be mature. Our goal at the end of our lives is not to be married. Some of us, the only goal in life we have is one day, hey, I just wanna get married. And that's a good goal. He says, hey, that's a big potential. But the biggest potential you will ever have is that day that you come to Jesus face to face. And you have to answer the question, did I live a life that made sense based on all that he's done for me? On that day, every other relationship that you have will end. At the end of your life, your best friend, your spouse, all of those relationships will end except for one, your relationship with God. And that relationship lasts forever. My, my challenge and my encouragement to you is that you would live your life for the relationship that lasts forever. That you would live your life in a manner that makes sense based off of all that Jesus has done for you. And you're like, what does this have to do with dating? That as you do that, you see people striving side by side with you. Living lives that make sense because of who Jesus is and what he's done. He said, that's the type of person I want to be with. Pray with me.